Amen. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, church family. It is so good to see you this morning, whether you are here in person or joining us online. My name is Garrett McCord, and I am the associate minister to students and their families, and it is a pleasure to be here. I would like to wish everybody a happy Labor Day this morning. Um, you know, I, I never really understood the whole, like, Labor Day out at the lake type of deal. Um, because I'm a youth pastor. Like, this is our Super Bowl, baby. I get to preach in big church. Like, y'all should have seen me this morning. I was getting hyped up. I'm excited, right? But um, I was actually gonna tell a joke about, you know, speaking of Labor Day, we're talking about labor, but Gary beat me to the punch, so scratch that one. Um, but in all seriousness, um, it is a neat little segue to where we're at in Ephesians this morning, right? The last few weeks, if you've been with us, Pastor Jason's been walking us through Ephesians 5 and 6, Lately, specifically, the portion in Ephesians called the household code, right? If you think back to the last couple of weeks, we've discussed wives submitting to their husbands, husbands loving their wives, children honoring their parents, and then parents not exasperating their children. And so today we finish that section on, in Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 9 on the household code. And so it's actually really cool that we get to cap off this section this morning by taking the Lord's Supper. And so just, just right now, I, I kind of want to just address this this morning. As we go through this text and as we talk, just please keep this in mind, right? Because we never want to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. I, I don't want it to just feel like an afterthought. And so just keep that in mind as we move towards that, um, that we get to do that together as a church family. And so um, that being said, before we even get to the text, we do have to address the elephant in the room in this passage, right? This is Ephesians 6, 5 through 9, masters and their slaves, so we gotta talk about slavery, right? That's the elephant in the room. So after you read this text, it kind of first, it, it seems like Paul's like not really saying anything about slavery, right? That he's not condemning it. Um, it it's kind of confusing, right? Like how is Paul, the guy who one minute talks about our freedom in Christ, the next minute talking about how bond servants or slaves are supposed to behave well in their captivity? And admittedly, this is kind of a tough question. Most of us have probably wrestled with at some point, especially in today's charged racial climate. And so obviously this is something that we have to struggle with and this is something that takes a lot more time to answer. But my hope this morning is before we dig into the text, I can provide a quick disclaimer. Um, it's gonna be a bit of an academic detour here, so, so bear with me that we don't get too far into the weeds. Um, but there's two real big things that we need to keep in mind while framing the discussion on, the slave, on slavery in the Bible. And first is that we have to shed our 21st century notions of slavery. What I mean by that is that we today, when we think of slavery, our minds go directly to the American slavery of the 17 and 1800s. The problem with that is that that occurred over 1600 years after Paul lived. Paul was writing about a form of slavery that was vastly different. And it is true in the world that Paul lived in, slaves were often treated as property and sometimes they were treated poorly. Now the Bible never condones them being treated poorly, but it was a fact. However, we have to keep in mind that on a whole, there was nowhere near the same brutality or level of just savagery that exists in American slavery and the slavery that existed in Paul's world. Right, Roman slavery was not based on race. In fact, the Bible explicitly condemns any sort of racial discrimination in Galatians 3.28. And some things about Roman slaves, they could actually own property, right? They could have families. Um, they could hold all sorts of positions within a household. And they could actually have great status depending on which family they served. There were some slaves who would have a higher social status than freedmen. In fact, many individuals would sell themselves into Roman slavery in order to gain Roman citizenship, knowing that they would eventually be freed because most Roman slaves were freed by age 30. There was often not really old slaves. And look, all of this being said, I am not condoning the practice of slavery and Paul isn't either. But what we have to know is that the slavery that Paul is writing about is not the slavery that we think of. And when we try to take his writings and fit them into our 21st century context, we do him a disservice. Secondly, just because Paul does not directly speak against slavery does not mean he is condoning it at all. He's just being realistic about the world that he lives in and addressing an issue, right? Because practically every household in the Roman Empire had a slave in it. That's why it's part of the household code, because it's something that existed in the home. 
Some estimate that there were as many as 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. In some cities, the population of slaves was as high as a third of the entire population. And so this is something that would be relevant to every single home. He realized that it was a part of everyday life and it always had been, but how he addresses the matter is by addressing those who are in the midst of it. So, so kind of to frame this, think about how Paul talks about or talks to Christians who are in persecution. Rarely do we see him writing to Nero saying, stop persecuting Christians. Instead, he writes to those believers who are in the midst of that struggling, in the midst of that strife, and encourages them to let their character shine through their actions, to let their Christian character go before them, because he knows that the key to transformation is starting with the spiritual root. He knows that if there are slaves who shine the light of the gospel to their masters, that those masters will have their hearts changed and that this sense of Christian brotherhood will soon spread and eventually lead to the eradication of slavery. And that's what happened, right? That's what happened with the Romans persecuting Christians. Eventually, the population of believers became so great that Constantine was saved and the persecution stopped. Right? In the same way with slavery, though much later in the 1700s with William Wilberforce, John Wesley, revivals led to the end of the European slave trade. And so by preaching the gospel, Paul is in turn preaching against the evils of slavery, even if it's in a kind of indirect way. All right, so I've got that out of the way. Address the elephant in the room. I have to be honest with you guys. Like, it's kind of a doozy, like getting really hyped up to go preach, and then you walk into the office, and Jason's like, all right, you get the slavery week. Uh, A little bit nerve-wracking. But having dealt with that elephant in the room, that leads us to ask, okay, what does this passage mean to us today? Because my goal is to not stand up here and give you a TED Talk on the Bible and slavery. I'll be honest, I am not smart or qualified enough to do that. I want no part of that. But what our goal is, is to show us how this text as 21st century Christians can apply to our lives. What can we take from it, right? And I believe that application today is to the relationship between worker and boss. That's the original heart of the text, workplace relationships. And so what I'd like to do for the rest of the time that we have this morning is to walk through the text and discuss what does it mean to be a good Christian worker and what does it mean to be a good Christian boss. And so it's gonna take a bit of perspective shift as we change gears from the masters and slaves to the employer-employee, so bear with me here. And so if you would, let's go ahead and start in verse five and we're gonna read through the text. Verse five, bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Let's pray with me. Lord God, thank you for your word this morning. I pray that you would go out and you would move among your people. Lord, that I would decrease and that you would increase, that you would go out from the preaching of your word and Holy Spirit, you would do what only you can do, that we would have a mindset of just expecting that you're gonna do something great this morning, God. We love you and praise you and pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, so at my time at Dallas Baptist University, I worked a few different jobs. Some of them I loved, some of them I did not love as much. And the one that I probably liked the least was working for the Department of University Housing. Why? Because my job was to answer phones, and let me tell you, people don't call the University Housing Department if things are good. (laughs) Right, nobody just calls, like, hey guys, how are y'all doing? We just wanna check in. It's not admissions, right? People aren't excited if they're calling the Housing Department. No, if they're calling the housing department, it's because little Emily didn't pay rent all summer, and how dare you charge my little angel late fees? I'm not kidding, I've had that conversation multiple times. But to make matters worse, uh, we had a boss who kinda liked to make life hard a little bit. She was a real sweet lady, but just professionally it was kinda difficult, right? And she was actually the second in charge, but the director was out of the office most of the time, so we ended up having more conversations and more face-to-face with her. And like I said, just 
very kind of my way or the highway, very like you have to do it this way, and even if it's the hardest way or even if it doesn't make sense, do it this way. And if we didn't do it her way, she would bring us in her office and chew us out, read us the right act, and it was just tough, right? Some of you shaking your heads, you know what I'm talking about, right? And the problem is I wasn't guilt-free either because after all of that would go down, I would go back to the office, I would grumble, I would gossip, I would be bitter, I'd be angry. And what that led to is this kind of toxic office culture where my coworkers weren't happy, I wasn't happy, nobody was happy, and that work culture eventually brought itself home to the point where Christine, who was my girlfriend at the time, would notice that my mood was different on the days that I worked there. It was a total mess. My life was marked by bitterness, anxiety, and just, just a, a vibe of just, just not good, right? And so eventually I left that job and went to work maintenance, and would you believe pulling hair out of shower drains was actually more enjoyable? But I tell this story to illustrate the fact that work relationships matter, right? Because this is often the afterthought of the household code, right? Like we hear, we give a lot of time to parents and their children, to wives and their husbands, but when was the last time any of us went to a conference on how to be a good employee, right? It doesn't have the same ring to it. But the thing is, these relationships matter because you're gonna spend more time at work than anywhere else in your life. I know, don't throw tomatoes at me, I'm sorry, that's just the truth. Statistics show that the average adult is gonna spend a third of their life in the workplace. Over 90,000 hours. Not only that, but work is probably our biggest mission field. It's where we're gonna come into contact with the most diverse group of people that we're going to, right? Because we tend to, we tend to get in our little bubbles, but work isn't that. Work, you work with who you work with. And that's your opportunity to share the gospel. And so these relationships matter. We have to give attention and thought to them. And so that's why this morning's text is so important. We need to see how we can be the best Christian worker or boss that we can be. How can we bring our faith to the workplace in a way that's impactful and will build the kingdom? That's what we're asking this morning. And so we're gonna walk back through the text a verse at a time, and we're just gonna walk through what the Lord has for us this morning. So we're just gonna read back through five. It says, bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. And so the first call to the Christian worker is to obey their authority or obey their boss with a high level of respect. The text literally says with fear and trembling. And now that's not to say that we're just kind of these complicit, terrified yes men who yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, just to prove everything. But the reason he uses the term fear and trembling is because that is the term that is used to show how we should relate to the authority of the Lord, right? Scripture says to work out your, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And he actually says this more clearly later in the verse when he says obey as you would Christ. And that's a lofty charge, right? To obey as you would Christ. I don't know about y'all, but I've had some bosses who don't really seem to warrant that status. It's kind of hard to see the manager of Panda Express in the same light as like the son of God who died for my sins. It's kind of a hard gap to bridge, right? But that's exactly the point that Paul is making here. Our submission to our bosses is not because their personality, character, or merit necessarily warrants it. No, we're called to respect our bosses because we believe that God has placed them in a position of authority above us. And when we honor our earthly authority, it honors our ultimate heavenly authority, that is Jesus. It shows that we know how to relate to authority. We know how to honor those above us. So for those of you who know me, you probably know that my wife does Taekwondo. Um, I'm pretty sure it was like one of the first things that was said from stage when we got here. Um, I definitely heard about that later that night. But some of you guys don't understand. <laughs> but so what the thing is, is when we first started dating, stepping into that world was a little bit of a trip, okay? Because her family is very well known in the Taekwondo world. Um, they're very successful. They do it really, really good. And so for a while, I was very affectionately known as the Henderson girl's boyfriend, <laughs> yeah, and so I would go to a tournament and it was like I was being just interrogated. Like there was, like it even happened after we were engaged, right? Like we would be engaged and I would show up and somebody would be like, oh, what are your intentions with Miss Henderson? Marriage? Like I thought that's what the whole ring thing was about, but. <laughs> and so 
The biggest adjustment, even though all that was great, right? It was hard, but you, you know, it humbles you. You get used to it. The biggest adjustment had to be the level of respect that was shown to high ranks, which is like the, the higher up black belts, the people who are really advanced in the organization, specifically a guy named Grandmaster G.K. Lee. Like this is the dude, right? Like he's top of the top. He's been doing this forever. He like, like he's that guy. And it's funny to watch them walk around at tournaments because people will be talking, they'll be hanging out, they'll be doing whatever, and then all of a sudden you just see people snap to attention and bow. I'll be honest, I kind of avoid him so I don't make myself look dumb. Like I just walk, the, walk around the other corner so I don't do something wrong. But because of his position as grandmaster, he commands a certain level of respect. You respect the position, even if you don't know him personally. And it's this type of respect that we are to show those in authority over us not because they've necessarily earned it, but because we believe that God has placed them in that position and he calls us to respect them. And look, of all people, we as Christians should understand how to relate to authority, right? Because we've submitted to the authority of Jesus. And so now that we're under human authority, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether that boss is a great boss or whether he makes you wanna pull your hair out, you know that, hey, the final authority rests in my Lord I know that he is for me, he is for my good, that he is in control, and so I'm not gonna lose any sleep over the humanly authority that's under him. And guys, if we can show this respect, it will shine the light of the gospel to those who we work with and under, right? By not partaking in that gossip, that grumbling, that slander, that disrespect, we're gonna look different. Like, think about the workplace culture today. Is that what it's characterized by? When you walk into your you know, run-of-the-mill fast food place, do you really see like a culture of workplace respect? Probably not. That's not to cast, that's painting with a broad brush, but if we can do these things, we will look different. We will stand out, and that is our opportunity to share the gospel. And the flip side of that, if we preach the gospel on Sundays and Wednesdays, but show up to work with a sour face, disrespectful, what does that make our gospel? What does that make our Lord look like? And so all of that being said, though, the face-to-face -face respect that we show those in authority over us is just part of the bigger picture, which takes us to what Paul says next in verses six and seven. He says, this is still talking about how we're supposed to obey. He says, obey not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. And so the second call that Paul gives to workers is to work with the integrity and, or work with integrity and with the Lord's motives at heart, right? With a pure motive. And Paul's addressing an issue that we've all probably struggled with or been touched with before, right? Eye service, people pleasing. You can probably think back this week and experience some time that you've had to deal with that. And what he's saying here is it's not just good enough to do a good job when the boss is watching, to gain some brownie points, to save face, to build a reputation. Instead, Paul says that we are literally supposed to render service with goodwill from the heart, right? This means always striving to do a good job, not just when we're being observed, not just when it really, really counts or it's crunch time, but always. And it also means that our efforts to do well should be with a good intention rather than just selfish or prideful ambitions, which is where we probably stumble more often, right? Good work done only when being watched is not good work at all. And good work being only done for selfish, prideful desires is still wrong in the eyes of the Lord. Our heart behind our work matters. So again, for those of you who know me, you know that my wife and I, we, we like to go work out together. That's one of our hobbies. Um, we go to CrossFit here in town. Save your CrossFit jokes for later. I've heard them all. But and we love to go to CrossFit. And if you've ever been to any gym class, you're gonna know what I'm talking about, right? In CrossFit, there is a coach who kind of guides the instruction and everything, right? And he walks around, he tells us what to do. And it's funny to kind of see how people's behavior changes when coach is facing the other way, right? Like they'll be doing jumping jacks and then coach turns around and it just kind of looks like they're flagging down a car. Or all of a sudden people forget how to count when coach turns around, one, two, 50, done, and then run off, right? Their heart behind their work is wrong, right? You wanna look good, not necessarily be good. And if that's your goal, that's what you're gonna get. As believers, though, 
We have a higher, better goal, right? We should be trying to please God, and we serve a God who sees everything. In Galatians 1.10, Paul writes, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Think about that. The weight that Paul gives to it right there. And look, we might be able to put on a face to those around us, but it's not fooling the Lord. He cares about our intentions. He doesn't care if we hit that quota. He doesn't care if we hit that commission goal or that sales goal. He looks at the heart. And that's not to say that we can just do a bad job with good intentions, but that if we are trying to do a good job, it needs to have good intentions. Just like the last point, if we work with integrity, this is an opportunity to shine a light for the gospel. Because like, if the last point is to show respect and obey authority, this is to do those things with the right reasons. This is getting to the heart of the matter. Martin Luther actually has a quote that says, the Christian shoemaker does his duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes, because God is interested in good craftsmanship. Amen. By doing our job well and with integrity, we honor God. And that is the ultimate goal of the Christian life, to glorify God. And so glorifying and pleasing God is actually where Paul goes next in verse eight, if you'll follow along with me. In verse eight, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or free. And so having given all of this instruction to the worker, Paul caps it off with a very, very important point. He says, whatever good is done, God will reward. Your reward comes from God. This is important and track with me here. It's not just important for encouragement, but it's important because when you hear all of these commands, it's really easy to kind of get into this transactional mindset, right? Like, okay, if I do this, 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 and this, then my professional life is just gonna be hunky-dory, peaches and cream, just fantastic bliss. But that's not the case that Paul's making here. Work might still be hard. That boss might still be a tyrant. They may never recognize your efforts you might not get that promotion, but that's okay. That's okay, because our reward is in heaven, right? It's greater than some professional bliss. It's greater than getting to the top of a ladder, right? It comes from our heavenly Father, the creator of the universe and the giver of all good gifts. And let me tell you, a gift from God is better than a corner office in a Porsche. Jesus himself says in Matthew seven eleven, if you then who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And guys, this is the key to Christian resilience. Right here, this is it. Right, when you're faced with that bad boss, that toxic work environment, those coworkers who wanna drive you up a wall, we can work on, we can persevere, knowing that our perfect Father in heaven sees all and he will reward us appropriately. And so this passage here, or this verse, ends the call to the Christian workers, but not the text, right? Next, Paul is gonna address the Christian boss. And while he only spends a verse on them, what he does say is quite powerful um, and carries quite a bit of an impact. And so follow along with me here in verse nine. He says, masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. And so let me start here by saying that what Paul says is just completely explosive for the world that he lives in, right? He's basically saying, hey, everything I just told the worker to do, yeah, boss, do the exact same thing. And remember, the original context of this verse and of this passage is masters and slaves. So much like Jason has shared with us the last few weeks of Paul completely turning normal relations on their head, he continues to do the same here. He calls employers to treat those under them as they themselves would like to be treated. He calls them to seek the welfare of their employees. And look, many of us are gonna run and try to put all these practical steps on this, right? Oh, well, this means fair wages, this means insurance, this means this and that and good vacation time. But it's far more than just that. The principle he's hitting at here is to lead means to serve. To lead is to serve. It's all encompassing, it's a lifestyle, it's a heart posture, it's how you carry yourself, right? 
And the principle of this leading and serving is most clearly modeled in the person of Jesus Christ. And I think back to the time when this was so clear, this principle of servant leadership is in the washing of the disciples' feet. It it didn't click with me until this past summer when we actually washed our students' feet at Cairo. And and I was just thinking through it, thinking what I was going to say. And for some reason, it just dawned on me, have you ever thought about how crazy the timing of this account is? Like when the foot washing happens, it's at the Last Supper. Hours before Jesus will be crucified. And I'll be honest, in that moment, the Lord just turned the mirror in on me. And I thought about, if I received a terminal diagnosis, or if I knew I had hours or days or weeks to live, how quickly would I just make this laundry list of selfish bucket list desires? I want to fulfill all the pleasures, do all the things I haven't done. But that wasn't Jesus. Jesus desired to take the form of a servant, wash the nasty feet of 11 men who would soon desert him and one who had already betrayed him, of the men whose sin would be the very thing that would nail him to that tree the next day. That just blows me away. I I almost don't have words. This is the same Jesus who said, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. And see, this is what God calls employers to, to serve those under them as they ask those under them to serve them not to micromanage, right? Not to treat as an ends to the mean, not to just use and abuse and dominate, but instead to love, to care for them, to serve them, to seek their welfare, to seek their promotion, even if the expense of some of one's own personal gain sometimes, right? And look, just as domination and and, and just rudeness and, and all of those sorts of negative attributes wouldn't be appropriate in any of the other relationships we've talked about so far, right? Parenting, um, marriage. It's not appropriate here. Like, do you realize this relationship is being grouped into that same grouping? Like the way that we should love and submit to our wives and our husbands, that we should submit to those that we work with and work under. Obviously there's distinctives there, but the heart remains the same. And guys, like employers should serve their employees. Why? Because that's who God is. Right? That's his character. He modeled that when he put on flesh and Jesus came to this earth. He showed us that's what it means, right? And think back to the whole theme of this whole last chapter that we've been walking through the past few weeks, right? At the very beginning, in chapter five, the whole discussion begins with the command not to be filled by the world, but to be filled by the Holy Spirit, right? Do y'all remember that? Not, don't be filled by the world, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit, And then this whole chapter has just been walking through what it looks like to be filled by the Holy Spirit. This is it. To be filled with the Spirit of God is to love and submit. It looks like a mutual, or it looks like a humility that leads to mutual submission. Husbands and wives, parents and children, employers and employees, right? It is modeling the humility and submission that Jesus showed when he came to earth, he put on flesh, he died for our sins. And it's actually in that act, the act of the cross, the greatest act of humility that the Lord or that the world has ever seen, that it was put on display for everybody to see. In Philippians 2, Paul, writing about Jesus, says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Amen. Amen.